and uh, thank you for coming in. Can you tell me what all these vases mean? Why well, these lovely <laughs> vases here? Yeah, Howard, that's a, a, a great question. And firstly, thank you for allowing me to come in and, and have this conversation. Um, probably about one year ago, I uh, was speaking with the Bose Museum and I got the opportunity to come up here and have a look around. And I'll be honest, I hadn't been before, and it's a place where I think everyone should definitely come. It's so fascinating. Obviously, you're very ver well versed in the history of, of the Bose Museum, but it's, it was the eclectic mix of artifacts that were here that really intrigued me. And I was asked about the possibility of creating a, a collection that might relate to some of the artifacts uh, at the Bose. That intrigued me, but we had to obviously find a vehicle for that collection. How was it going to be generated? What was going to be the theme? And I think through those discussions, firstly, we had the conversation that um, running through everything that we have in the museum, um, whether it's fashion, um, paintings, ceramics, silverware, we essentially have some basic components, such as form, they all have a form, but of course they all have uh, an element of colour. In some cases it's a uh, very limited colour, in other cases it's very extreme colours because of the nature of the eclectic collection. So really what we decided is that the exhibition was going to bring all that together and we're going to look at colour. So as you go around the museum, one of the things that really fascinated me was the, um, the clobbered vases. The vases which you kindly explained to me at the time had come from China, uh, had come to the UK, had come to England, and um, their patination on the outside was changed or was covered, and the form of those Chinese vases was adjusted, in some cases very brutally as well. And you can see that obviously at the museum. But I thought if we're doing a, a project in colour, then we need a canvas for showing our colour. And I thought, what better way to do that than actually to use uh, a porcelain vase that was in a style of a, a, a generic sort of Chinese vase. So that was really the starting point. Obviously, we have a lot of connections with China as well. So it was uh, quite interesting to connect what's happening with the Bose team here and, and designers that are out in China. But essentially what we've done here, or what I've done, is I've selected 80 artifacts in the museum, analyzed the color, taken a color reference, because as I think I've said many times over the months that the show has been running, the exhibition has been running, we shouldn't really refer to a color as a, a cherry red or a, uh, a blood red or a brick red. We need to give it a reference. So we started looking at the 80 artifacts understanding their colours, understanding their references, and then bringing those together. And what we did, we created um, the transfers that go onto the vases. Now, I know a lot of people look at the vases and say, well, I don't understand what painting or what artefact this is from. Um, there's two very good reasons for that, really. Um, firstly, is that we have only looked at colour. And so the reference on the vases is purely colour. It's not about the subject matter that we saw in the painting or, you know, the form of some silverware that we saw. So we've taken something that's very simplistic and used the colours on the vases. Aside to that, actually, we've also had to create transfers that will go on to this form because this form is a compound curve. So like a football or like a head, if we try to create a transfer that will go over the whole form, it would crumple, just like paper would crumple going over a, a football if you tried to wrap it. Um, so we've used individual transfers. They're all unique and they've gone over the surface of the vases. When we looked at the colours and when we begin to put the colourways together, there were two sort of approaches that we did. One was um, uh, looking at colour contrasts. So we're looking at things such as um, uh, hot and cold, um, light and dark colour contrasts. And we also looked at um, 
uh, approaches to color, which are things like tetradic uh, colorways, where we're taking different colors and looking at them differently onto the color wheel. Um, and we can see that evidenced throughout the museum. So behind me, you can see one of the boards that explains those, those color, colors that have gone onto the vases. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. Um, obviously, there's a lot more detail than that, but essentially we've taken reference from 80 vases and transposed that in some way onto the vase. Well, that I understand. I mean, my come to this subject from a slightly different angle from like the history of ceramics. And of course, vases don't have an obvious function. You don't tend to put tea or sugar in them. They're display pieces. They can either be classical or Chinese. But it's clear in the past, in the 18th century, that rich families would have them on the mantelpiece or in the house or even in the garden, really to explain their taste, which could be classical, coming from Greece or Rome, or in the 17th century, uh, there was a huge market for this new import from the Far East, this new exotic import of porcelain, which that of course we call China from the country where it comes from. And it's got this great virtue of being translucent, meaning if it's thin, the light will shine through. And so any colors you put upon it become more vibrant. And I believe the colors are basically chemical oxides that are then fired to several hundred degrees or maybe a thousand degrees in a kiln and are fired in and won't easily come off. Um, but at that stage, you get this very, very bright color that's, I believe, the same technique as enamels. So it's very vibrant. You can see it uh, from far away. It's still used, I think, for things like street signs, isn't it? Easy to clean and, and, so, and in some ways better, more functional than many of the wonderful oil paintings we have here where oil on canvas or panel will, of course, at some stage, may wish to flake off or something. So they're relatively solid. Um, I also have an interest in uh, what Davis referred to these clobbered vases, where a blue and white, white vase would come from China in the 17th century, and then when blue and white went out of fashion in the early 19th century, it was possible for London China dealers to add extra colours yeah. to them. And in modern view, really completely um, transforming them, probably damaging them. But nowadays we leave that. And we have a number of these that we know came to us in 1878, which means they're fairly historic. And we've had them written up in articles and so on. Um, I learned earlier this week that some huge vases that were sold to the King of Saxony by the King of Prussia for a whole troop of Dragoon Guards had earlier been in the collection of Mary II of England in London. So you can see at the top level, when I say huge, these are huge, these things went between kings and princesses. And down to the stage is more upper class, middle class, I think, you know. And you could have these on your mantelpiece and garnitures. And they tell you stories or people say, what is the story? And that is the aim of the exhibition. You look a bit more closely. And I'm looking at as a painting with blues and greys and landscapes, and I can see the same colours coming on a porcelain vase. Obviously, we could only reference uh, a handful of the colours in a painting. I mean, they're, they're, if you were to analyse the colours truly in a painting, you'd find there are thousands and thousands of, of tones and colours. A few things that uh, you mentioned that uh, we should pick up on. Firstly, you talk about, or well, you picked up again on this uh, clobbered vase which I really love this concept. It's sort of a concept which we see in our own homes. You know, sometimes you move into a home and you just put wallpaper on top of wallpaper. In a sense, that's a form of, that, that's a similar approach to the clobbered vase. We don't like the, the wallpaper that was left. We put new wallpaper up and we've clobbered the, the interior, I suppose. But what we're hoping to do with this collection, um, when it uh, concludes on the 31st of October this year, is that this collection will go to a, another museum. I do quite a lot of work actually, um, as you know, in China. So it's possible that part of this collection or all of this collection will head out to China. And the intention is that new decoration will go or new patination will go on top of these vases. So we have quite a lot of space 
on the vases. As you walk around, you see, oh, that doesn't look very full. But I think that um, we want these vases to go on a journey. Um, we talk about this journey, you know, of colour, uh, which the whole exhibition is titled. We talk about the connection with um, um, around the world in 80 days, because it coincided the publication with um, um, the same uh, 150 years um, from, from today, so that, uh, you know, from 2022 20, was 150 years. So that's really why I think we picked also um, 80 objects. But we would like these vases to go around the world. We'd like them to head out to China. We'd like um, communities, um, institutions, organizations, individuals to create their own patination and not be worried actually about putting on top of here because we can clobber these vases again and again. We can create new transfers. We only need a PDF to create a, a ceramic transfer. We can do that in many different ways. It can be a piece of art, it can be digital art, it can be a photograph of objects, and it can go onto these vases. I suppose we would really like the reference of the new patination, the new um, pieces going onto these vases to reference another collection. Um, I have an exhibition opening at the Juende Art Museum in Southern China next month. Maybe there's an opportunity there that there's artifacts at that museum that can have the same um, investigative work done and references will go on top of here. It's sort of this reverse of what we see at the museum here, where the vases came from China and they got clobbered by the English. You know, it'd be nice now for the English to send back um, the vases and for them to get clobbered by the Chinese. There's a couple of other things though. Um, that you mentioned, which I think we need to backtrack on, because um, I feel quite strongly about it. Obviously, vases did have very much a function back in the day. Um, when they were first being uh, created, they were functional pieces. And then, you're absolutely right, they became decorative pieces um, and uh, a symbol, if you like, of, of status. Um, but I think because they become that, that becomes their function. So I, I would say that this vase, if you do nothing with it, you don't put anything in it or anything like that, it has a function. It has a function to make you feel better. It has a function as an as a object that you enjoy around your home. And I think we see this perhaps more clearly in um, when, when we see the chairs that we're sat on. These are very functional chairs. We sit on these, we expect to sit on these. But you see chairs that are more elaborate and you see signs even around the museum that say, do not sit on this chair. So they're not necessarily functioning as a, as a seat, but they are functioning in many other ways. They're functioning as a historical item, artifact that you can learn about. They're, they're functioning as um, an understanding, communicating craftsmanship from the past. So I think everything does have a function. And I think these vases, even if they're not going to be used in the traditional sense, still have that um, aesthetic function. Um, the other thing that we've talked about, obviously these were done in transfers, and we did look originally at the artwork being done over in China and shipping them here. Obviously, we decided not against that, but it wasn't actually any cheaper to hand paint these pieces than to create the ceramic uh, transfers. But if these are going to be clobbered, um, we can put new transfers over the top, but we could have done underglazed painting, we could have done overglazed painting. We could still paint on these objects because they have been glazed. So that we still have a whole remit of opportunity, a whole range of opportunities that we can do with these vases. And I think passing it on to a, another body, um, another group of artists, exploring with another set of artifacts in a museum, will only enhance the vases because we'll begin to see their um, metamorphosis, if you like, into something new. And maybe when it's been to another museum, whether it's UK or China, it will then travel again to another one. And we'll have a vase which is full of patination. But more importantly, specifically, I think anyway, is that it's full of story and content. You know, it's been to the bows, it's been to China, it's been to European museums, etc. Um, yeah.
Do you think Chinese taste is, I mean, in the tradition of the past, it was very different to European taste. But do you think that decoration in China would be different from what's added in Europe? Or are we much more international culture? Um, I would say in the 18th or 19th century, the last stage would have been adding gilding, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've travelled to China a lot and uh, I've travelled all over China. Um, but there, there are so many different practices in China. I mean, China has amazing history and amazing craftsmanship. Um, uh, and people that are able to do those crafts in traditional ways, with traditional paints, traditional brushes, traditional firing, all of these things. And then obviously there's more contemporary approaches as well. Certainly when I, when I travel to China, I see a lot of um, uh, young designers, young artists, let's say under 45, that generally are speaking uh, multiple languages, including English. Um, they are very influenced by many things. Obviously the Chinese culture is so important and is priority number one, but they're influenced by many things because they have access to media and uh, different influences. So I, I expect that depending on who the artist is that takes on board this, if it's a young person, then maybe we'll see something very contemporary coming on top of these vases. If we see uh, a traditional craftsman, or as in China you would say the master, um, working in a traditional way, uh, you might see something with more heritage and more sort of um, story and background. Um, but I think it doesn't matter, does it really? I think these vases have been influenced by some things that are relatively contemporary in the scheme of things here, and some things were very old in the scheme of things here. And um, when you just look at the vases, you can't actually tell what has been influenced by the oldest artifact here and what's been influenced by the newest. And I would love to see craftsmen, whether it's in China or whether it's in Europe or the States or wherever it may be, take on board these vases and apply their own sort of um, interpretation of it. Or I get involved with them and work with them. So what interests me is sometimes you get calligraphy on Chinese vases. That is that still done as porcelain decoration, or is it something associated with the 18th and 19th century? I think personally, I've not I've not seen much calligraphy on vases, but I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't seen it. Um, but I've seen a lot of calligraphy, um, and I have a lot of friends that are masters at calligraphy. They get up at four or five in the morning every day to do their practice, you know, and they're uh, an older generation and they are absolutely dedicated to their calligraphy and their brushwork, mark making, etc. I haven't come across the calligraphy on the vases, but I'm absolutely certain it, it, it I'm sure it exists out there. I've definitely seen, you know, the different styles of uh, painting on vases and uh, contemporary transfers as well. And, um, yeah, so it's a broad range. I mean, it's a huge country. There's a lot of experience and a lot of um, uh, skill throughout the country. Okay. Well, Dave, as we're sitting here, I'm noticing these colours dancing up and down these columns. <laughs> Can you tell me how that relates to the exhibition? <laughs> yes. Okay, so when we were planning the exhibition, um, obviously the main focus was on the artefacts and uh, we talk about this canvas being the vases and creating the vases. But um, we wanted to have an interactive element to the exhibition as well. We do actually um, have some hidden messages in some of these vases. So there are trails and uh, individuals can try and find the, the hidden messages in the vases. But in creating the towers, um, we wanted um, uh, individuals to be able to play with colour um, in a different way. So not through paints or chalks or, or, or traditional ways but actually influence the light. Now what we've got at the moment in, in the exhibition space is that we've got two of the towers, the two end towers, are just on a sequence. And, and I should say that we've developed these with uh, studios in, or a studio in southern China as well, who are able to monitor the colours that we've got um, on here. So they can change these if we want them to, or change the sequences. But we have some very um, uh, relaxed, I think, sequences running through the two end towers. 
The two middle towers look like they're switched off, but in actual fact, they're not switched off. Um, they both have cameras. I should say that the Chinese staff in, uh, in southern China can't see anybody through the camera, um, uh, but they are able to adjust color and the identification of color. So when somebody comes into the exhibition space and they stand on one of the marked spots, the camera on these stands will uh, take nine references. Uh, there's an algorithm that then combines those nine elements, those nine colors. So for example, if they were looking at my top, um, it's a little bit dark actually, but if they were looking at my top, it would take nine references. Some areas are lighter than, than others, um, and it would combine those, and that would be sent to the tower, and then the tower would change to that. The, the towers are, are quite sensitive, the cameras are quite sensitive, and they tend to respond really well to the much brighter colours. Um, so we have a, a range of t-shirts also out in the display, which if somebody's not wearing a bright colour, they can hold the t-shirt the up to the camera from the marker, and you'll see the tower change colour. Well, that's amazing. I mean, uh, it's really interesting to see, hear all these different approaches to colours on ourselves and in objects. And it would be fascinating then to see, after some of these artefacts have travelled across the world, to see what comes back, so to speak, and yeah. how it's been reinterpreted. I mean, I look forward to them going on their journey. We talked about this uh, whole exhibition being Journey of Colour, and I don't think it really is ending on the 31st of October. It's just the vases will leave their starting point and they will take on this journey of colour. And I hope that, you know, maybe there'll be an opportunity in uh, forthcoming years for some of the vases to return and maybe be displayed somewhere around the museum, maybe down in the reception with a short note saying, you know, we're home. <laughs> well, I hope so too. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dave. That was fascinating. Thank you, Howard, for your time and thank you to everyone at the Bose Museum.